Okay, so get this. Today we're going full on ancient aliens, but like with a PhD. Think Indiana Jones's, but instead of hunting for the Ark of the Covenant, he's deciphering ancient texts. Like what if those dusty old myths and legends weren't just stories, you know? What if they were like, I don't know, early drafts of humanity for dummies? That's Greg Braden's whole jam, right? This scientist explorer dude who's basically saying, hey, what if ancient cultures knew stuff we're only just now rediscovering with all our fancy science? Like finding your great grandma's recipe book and realizing she's a freaking culinary genius ahead of her time. Right. And Braden's convinced those recipes are the keys to understanding consciousness, unlocking hidden human potential, maybe even fiddling with our own DNA. He's pulling from science, ancient texts, archaeology, the whole shebang. Okay, so let's unpack this, starting with Braden's big idea. Ancient wisdom meets modern science. Is he saying our ancestors were, like, walking around quoting Einstein? Well, he's definitely pointing out some freaky parallels, like how physicists are all hyped about quantum entanglement now, right? Where particles can be linked across vast distances. So, like, if one electron stubs its toe, its entangled buddy on the other side of the universe feels it. Exactly. And what's wild is that ancient traditions have been talking about this interconnected web of life forever. Like, indigenous cultures, mystics, they've been on that vibe for millennia. It makes you wonder if all that stuff we've labeled as woo-woo might actually have some scientific basis. Okay, so if ancient cultures were so tuned in, what happened? Did we collectively hit the delete button on human evolution? Braden suggests some knowledge was lost, like through natural disasters or societal upheavals. But he also throws out this idea, what if some info was like purposely hidden? Wait, hold up. Is he implying there's some men in black scenario going down where they're keeping the real truth from us? He mentions this thing called the Brookings Report from way back in the 60s. Basically, it said, hey, governments might freak out and bury big discoveries if they thought people weren't ready for them. That's kind of creepy, right? Yeah. Makes you wonder if those history textbooks are telling the whole story. Right. And what kind of info are we talking about here? Alien tech. The secret to immortality. No. The real recipe for Coca-Cola. Who knows? Well, Brayden points to some pretty juicy examples. Like, there's this theory about a hall of records hidden under the Sphinx. Oh yeah, the Sphinx? Like imagine a secret library buried under one of the most iconic monuments ever. What's in there? Blueprints for the pyramids, the Holy Grail, Beyonce's lost album. No one knows for sure, but something it holds a record of human history going way back, like 50,000 years. That's like saying your family tree includes cavemen. It would totally rewrite everything we think we know about our past. Whoa, okay, and it's not just the Sphinx, right? Braden talks about all this buzz around potential ancient structures under Antarctica's ice. Yeah. Antarctica. Total the thing vibes. Like, what if there's a whole civilization chilling under the ice caps? I mean, there are those satellite images and weird magnetic readings. Some people think there's got to be something down there. Right. And then there's that whole face on Mars thing. <sighs> yes. The face on Mars. The ultimate, do you see what I see when it comes to believing in ancient astronauts or just funky looking rocks? Exactly. Science says it's just shadows and stuff, but Braden and others are like, hmm, what if? They're intrigued by the possibility. So we've got potential secret chambers under the Sphinx, whispers of buried cities in Antarctica, and a Martian monument that might be an intergalactic Kilroy was here. It's like someone scattered pieces of a puzzle across the planet and maybe even beyond, and we're just now starting to find them. Right. And this is where Braden throws in another curveball. He says, this knowledge might not have just been lost randomly. It could have been protected, hidden on purpose. Okay, so now we're talking secret societies, um, mystery schools, like something out of national treasure. Yeah. He's saying maybe there were groups throughout history tasked with guarding this wisdom, keeping it under wraps until, like, humanity was ready for it. It's like a cosmic time capsule just waiting for the right moment to be cracked open. Huh. But who gets to decide when that is? Well, Braden thinks it might be us. Today's generation, with our endless curiosity and our love for challenging the status quo, maybe we're the ones who hold the key. So we're like the chosen ones, mm. the key masters of the universe. That's a lot of pressure. It is, right? But it's also kind of awesome. Think about it. Awesome, right? Like, imagine the possibilities if we really are the ones who can unlock all this ancient wisdom. I mean, what if it holds the solutions to the problems we're facing today? Okay, that's a whole other rabbit hole. But before we go there, Tell me more about Braden himself. This whole ancient wisdom meets modern science thing, it sounds kind of new agey, mm. you know. But then you mentioned he worked on, like, top secret government projects. 
Yeah, get this. He was a systems designer for the Peacekeeper missile program. Like, the Cold War nuclear weapons stuff. Wait, seriously. The guy who talks about love and harmony and connecting with the universe helped build a weapon of mass destruction. That's a serious plot twist. Right. Braden was literally writing code for the Peacekeeper while simultaneously studying ancient spiritual traditions. Talk about a mind split. It's like he was living a double life. By day, he's a defense contractor. By night, he's a mystic meditating on a mountaintop. Did he ever talk about how he reconciled those two worlds? He did. He said it created this huge inner conflict for him. On the one hand, he felt the weight of responsibility for the potential consequences of his work. And on the other, he was drawn to the power of ancient wisdom to promote peace and healing. It's like he was trying to balance the forces of creation and destruction. Exactly. And ultimately, he came to believe that technology itself isn't good or bad. It's all about how we choose to use it. Makes sense, like a knife can be used to cook a meal or, you know, do some serious damage. Right. It's our intention, our consciousness, that determines the outcome. And this is where Braden gets really deep. He talks about the power of collective consciousness to shape reality. Okay, so, like, are we talking the secret here? Can we just manifest world peace by thinking positive thoughts? Well, Braden's not saying it's quite that simple, but he does believe that our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs have a way bigger impact on the world than we realize. He points to research in quantum physics and epigenetics, fields that are showing how our inner world influences the outer world. So it's not just about sitting around visualizing a better world. It's about actually embodying those changes within ourselves. Exactly. Our thoughts and feelings aren't just happening in a vacuum. They're creating ripples, impacting the energy field around us, influencing the collective consciousness. Okay, so if enough people focus on fear and anger and division, we're collectively creating a real-life dystopia. That's a possibility, and you know we see evidence of that playing out all the time. But the flip side is that when enough people choose love, compassion, unity, that creates a different ripple effect. So it's like a giant game of telephone, but with our vibes. Exactly. And Brayden thinks we're at a tipping point where a critical mass of people are waking up to this power we have as co-creators of reality. Okay, I'm feeling a little more optimistic now. Mm. But let's be real. There's a lot of scary stuff happening in the world right now. It's enough to make you want to just hide under the covers. It's definitely a challenging time, no doubt. But Braden says hiding from it all isn't the answer. He thinks fear actually shuts us down, limits our ability to see possibilities and create positive change. So facing our fears is like leveling up in a video game. Something like that. He encourages us to cultivate a grounded optimism, to acknowledge the challenges, but also to hold a vision of a better future. Okay, so... What are some of the tools Braden suggests for tapping into this inner technology and shaping reality? He talks about meditation, mindfulness, gratitude, and connecting with nature. Practices that help us become more aware of our thoughts and emotions to shift our energy. Those all sound great, but do they actually work? Like, can meditation really stop a war? Can gratitude cure a disease? Well, Braden acknowledges there are no quick fixes. Transformation is a process, right? But he believes that by cultivating these inner qualities, we become more aligned with peace, harmony, healing, and that can have a ripple effect. So it's like as more individuals become more conscious and compassionate, the collective consciousness shifts. Exactly. And this is where Braden gets really excited. He thinks we're on the verge of a major evolutionary leap, that humanity is waking up to its true potential. Okay, I'm intrigued. But speaking of evolution, let's talk about Braden's more out there ideas. Like the whole thing about changes happening in human DNA right now. Yeah, buckle up, because this is where things get trippy. Braden says scientists have observed some crazy changes in human DNA since like the mid 90s. And he thinks it points to an accelerated evolution that's happening in response to, you know, the craziness of our time. Wait, so we're evolving on fast forward. What's triggering that? 5G, chemtrails, cosmic yeah. rays. Braden doesn't really give a specific cause, but he says it could be a combo of things. Environmental stress, maybe. Our exposure to all this tech. Even shifts in the Earth's magnetic field. Who knows? So our DNA is like adapting to the chaos. It's like a biological software update. Exactly. And instead of becoming, you know, Skynet and taking over the world, it seems to be trying to help us thrive in this increasingly complex world. So what are these DNA changes actually doing? Are they giving people telekinetic powers or the ability to breathe underwater? Well, Braden doesn't go that far, but he suggests these mutations could enhance certain abilities like immunity, stress response, intuition, maybe even empathy. 
He thinks they could be leading us towards a more evolved version of humanity. Okay, I'm down with that. But if these changes are happening, why aren't we seeing more X-Men walking around? Well, Brayden says it's still early days, and these changes aren't happening to everyone equally. Some folks might be more susceptible, maybe due to their genes, their lifestyle, even their level of consciousness, he says. So it's like a genetic lottery. Some people get superpowers, and the rest of us are stuck with our regular old human abilities. Well, he doesn't frame it like that. He thinks we all have the potential to tap into this evolutionary shift, even if we weren't born with those specific genetic advantages. He talks about how certain practices, lifestyle choices, can actually influence our DNA, activate dormant genes, and help us adapt and evolve. Wait, so you're saying we can change our DNA, like rewrite our genetic code? That's mind-blowing. I know, right? It really challenges the old idea that our genes are fixed. Braden believes we have way more control over our biology than we think, and that our thoughts, emotions, even our intentions can impact our genes. Whoa, okay, my head is spinning. So if we can influence our own evolution, what kind of future are we creating? Are we headed towards utopia or a real life Planet of the Apes situation? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And this is where Braden gets really deep. He says we're at a crossroads, a point where we have to make some serious choices about the kind of world we want to live in. Choices like what? Recycle more. Eat less meat. Meditate daily. It's bigger than that, he says. It's about recognizing that technology alone won't save us. We need to balance our technological advancements with a deeper understanding of who we are, our connection to nature, and our responsibility to future generations. Okay, so a more holistic approach. But let's be honest, sometimes it feels like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Mm. How do we stay hopeful in the face of all this? That's a great question. And, you know, Brayden gets that. He doesn't deny the challenges, but he encourages us to remember that we're not alone in this. We're part of something much bigger than ourselves, and we have access to a wisdom that's way older than humanity itself. Okay, I like that. But let's get back to those DNA changes for a second. He calls them something specific, right? Those kids who are showing up with different abilities. Yeah, he calls them millennium children. He thinks they're like the forerunners of this evolutionary leap. So they're like the beta testers for Humanity 2.0. Exactly. And Brayden doesn't see it as like a competition. He thinks we can all learn from these kids. They're showing us what's possible when we tap into our full potential. So they're like guides, mentors, the cool older siblings we never had. Something like that. He thinks they're paving the way for a more evolved humanity, one that's more connected, more compassionate, more in tune with the natural world. I'm really digging this. But what are these Millennium children actually like? Do they have like glowing eyes? telepathic powers? Can they fly? Well, Brayden describes them as being highly intuitive, empathic, connected to nature, and they often have a strong sense of purpose. They might have some unusual abilities too, like heightened creativity or a natural affinity for technology, but, you know, they're not necessarily walking around with capes. So how do we find these kids? Are they hanging out in secret underground lairs, attending schools for gifted mutants? Brayden thinks they're probably just blending in with everyone else. They might be your neighbors, your friends, even your own kids. Whoa, that's pretty wild. So we should be on the lookout for kids with extraordinary abilities. He encourages us to be open to the possibility that we might encounter these individuals in our everyday lives. You never know who might be hiding a superpower under the surface. Okay, I'm definitely gonna be paying more attention now. This is like living in a real life comic book. Mm-hmm. But let's get back to the challenges we were talking about earlier. Braden talks about some pretty serious threats facing humanity. I'm curious to hear his take on that. Yeah, he doesn't shy away from the tough stuff. And one of the biggest threats he talks about is biological weapons. Okay, so now we're talking about real-life supervillains, the kind who create deadly viruses and unleash them on the world. It's a scary thought, and Braden doesn't downplay the danger. He says these weapons could be even more dangerous than nukes. More dangerous than nukes? How's that possible? He says they're easier to make, harder to detect, and a single attack could wipe out entire populations. It's like something out of a nightmare. Okay, that's terrifying. So, do we all need to start building bunkers and stocking up on hazmat suits? Brayden doesn't think fear is the answer. He says the best defense against these threats is actually to cultivate a higher level of consciousness. Wait, so, like, 
meditate our way out of a bio attack? Not exactly, but he talks about how our thoughts and emotions can actually influence our immune systems and our overall health. It's like creating a shield of positive energy. Okay, so back to the power of the mind. Right, and this is where he gets really interesting. He thinks we can shift our internal resonance to the point where we're not susceptible to these harmful pathogens. Hold on, shift our internal resonance. What does that even mean? Think of it like tuning a radio to a specific frequency. Braden says our bodies and minds are like finely tuned instruments, and we can learn to adjust our internal frequency to the point where we're vibrating at a level that's incompatible with disease. So it's like we're creating an invisible force field around ourselves, repelling negative energy and attracting positive energy. Exactly. And he says this isn't some supernatural power. It's a natural capacity that we can develop through practices like meditation and energy healing. Okay, I'm starting to see the bigger picture here. We need to cultivate our inner technology to enhance our well-being and protect ourselves from threats. Right. It's about recognizing that our inner world and the outer world are connected and that by transforming ourselves, we can actually help transform the world. That's a powerful idea, but it's also a lot of responsibility. It's like we're all superheroes in training, trying to figure out how to use our powers for good. Exactly. And Brayden says this isn't about becoming superhuman or trying to control everything. It's about recognizing that we're part of a larger web of life and that our choices and actions have consequences that ripple outwards. Okay, so it's about interconnectedness and acting responsibly. Right. And this is where Brayden's work comes full circle. He says that ancient wisdom traditions understood this interconnectedness, and they offer valuable insights for navigating these challenges. So it's not just about science. It's about merging science with spirituality. Exactly. And this is what makes Braden's work so compelling. He bridges the gap between these two worlds, exploring the mysteries of consciousness and how ancient wisdom can help us understand the universe and our place in it. This is making my brain hurt in a good way. But before we get too philosophical, let's talk about something more practical. Braden also talks about free energy technologies, right? Yes. This is where things get really tangible. He's not just talking about theories. He's talking about real world technologies that could change everything. Okay. Free energy sounds almost too good to be true. Is he talking about those perpetual motion machines that never seem to work? Not quite. He's talking about tapping into natural sources of energy that are all around us, like the Earth's magnetic field, the sun's energy, even something called zero-point energy. Okay, now we're talking zero-point energy. That sounds like something straight out of Star Trek. Yeah. So are these free energy technologies actually working? Braden says there are examples being used in some parts of the world, like small systems that can power homes using energy from the environment. He also talks about Nikola Tesla, who was way ahead of his time with his free energy research. Oh yeah, Tesla, the original mad scientist. Mm -hmm. But if these technologies are real, why aren't they everywhere? Why are we still stuck with fossil fuels and paying outrageous energy bills? That's the million dollar question, right? And Braden says the answer is pretty complicated. He talks about how the development of these technologies has been suppressed by powerful interests like governments and corporations. So wait, so we're talking about a conspiracy theory here, like a secret cabal that's keeping free energy hidden from the world. Well, Braden doesn't use that kind of language. He focuses on the evidence, and he makes a pretty strong case that there are forces that have worked to prevent free energy from becoming mainstream. Okay, so it's not just about the tech itself. It's about the politics and economics of energy. Exactly. And this is where Braden gets really insightful. He's not just about inventing new gadgets. He's about transforming the systems that run our world, challenging the powers that be. That's a tall order. <laughs> but if free energy can liberate us from fossil fuels, it's definitely worth fighting for. Absolutely. And Braden's message is all about empowering us to create a different kind of future, one that's based on abundance, sustainability, and harmony with nature. I'm totally on board with that. But let's switch gears for a second. Braden also talks about Atlantis, right? The Lost City. Ah, uh, yes, Atlantis, the ultimate legend. Most people dismiss it as a myth, but Braden's not so quick to do that. Okay, so we're going deep into the what-if zone here. Mm -hmm. What evidence does he present for Atlantis actually existing? Well, he starts with Plato, the Greek philosopher who wrote about Atlantis. Braden says Plato's account shouldn't be dismissed as just a story, but considered as a possible historical record. So he's saying Plato might have been writing about a real civilization. That's what he's suggesting. He points to the level of detail in Plato's description of Atlantis, its geography, culture, technology. 
He thinks Plato might have been drawing on some ancient source, maybe a lost text or an oral tradition. Okay, but if Atlantis was real, where was it? Yeah. I always pictured it somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but that seems pretty yeah. far-fetched. Braden explores all sorts of theories about its location. Some think it was in the Mediterranean Sea, others the Caribbean. There are even those who say it was in Antarctica. Antarctica, seriously. How could a technologically advanced civilization exist in a place like that? Well, Braden points out that Antarctica might not have always been covered in ice. There's geological evidence that suggests it might have been in a more temperate zone in the distant past. Okay, now my head is really spinning. So we've got a lost continent, a hidden civilization, and a mysterious ancient text. This is like Indiana Jones's meets the X-Files. Mm -hmm. But is there any actual physical evidence to back up this Atlantis theory? That's the big question. And while there's no definitive proof, Braden does point to some intriguing anomalies, like there are underwater structures that have been found in various parts of the world. So like sunken pyramids, yeah. underwater cities. Some researchers think that's a possibility. He also talks about the Bimini Road, this weird rock formation off the coast of the Bahamas that some people believe might be part of a submerged city. Okay, this is getting juicy. but. If these underwater structures are real, how do they end up there? Did a giant earthquake swallow up Atlantis? Was there some kind of catastrophic flood? Graydon explores all sorts of theories. A massive earthquake, maybe. A volcanic eruption. A comet impact. He even talks about the possibility that Atlantis might have been intentionally submerged, maybe because of a war or a natural disaster. So it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a riddle. Pretty much. But even if we never find definitive proof, Braden thinks the story of Atlantis holds important lessons for us. He suggests that Atlantis might have been a super advanced civilization that got a little too big for its britches, and its destruction was a result of its own arrogance. So it's a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked technology and the importance of respecting nature. Exactly. And Braden thinks we're facing similar challenges today. He says we need to learn from the mistakes of the past and choose a different path, one that's more sustainable, compassionate, and in harmony with the planet. Okay, I can get behind that. But even if there's some truth to the Atlantis story, it's still a pretty big leap to connect it to our modern world. It is. But Braden encourages us to approach these mysteries with curiosity and draw our own conclusions. He doesn't want us to blindly believe anything, but to explore the evidence and see where it leads. That's fair. It's like we're all detectives trying to solve a cosmic puzzle. Exactly. And speaking of mysteries, let's talk about secret societies. Braden has some interesting things to say about their role in safeguarding ancient wisdom. Ooh, secret societies. Now we're talking. So is he talking about the Freemasons? The Illuminati? Yeah. The lizard people? Well, he doesn't name any specific groups, but he does talk about the possibility that there are organizations that have been operating behind the scenes for centuries, protecting ancient knowledge and wisdom. So they're like the guardians of the ancient mysteries, waiting for the right time to reveal them to the world. That's one way to look at it. And Braden thinks that time might be now. He says we're living in a time of great awakening when more and more people are searching for truth and questioning authority. It does feel like there's something in the air, a shift happening, like the world is waking up from a long slumber. And Braden believes this growing awareness is creating the conditions for a renaissance of ancient wisdom, a time when this hidden knowledge can finally come out into the open and help guide humanity towards a better future. Okay, I'm feeling a little tingly now. This is getting epic. It's definitely exciting. But, you know, even with all this talk of ancient wisdom and human potential, it's hard to ignore the mess we've made of things. Climate change, social unrest, the whole shebang. It can feel kind of overwhelming. I hear you. Braden doesn't sugarcoat the challenges, but he sees them as a necessary part of the process. He talks about how crisis can be a catalyst for growth, okay. you know? Like those moments when you think you're totally screwed and then suddenly you find this hidden strength you never knew you had. Exactly. He thinks humanity is going through something similar right now. We're being pushed to our limits, forced to confront our own BS and make some hard choices about the future we want to create. It's like we're in that scene from The Matrix where Neo has to choose between the red pill and the blue pill. Right. Do we stick with the familiar but ultimately destructive path or do we take the leap into the unknown and embrace a new way of being? So Braden's saying we're at a crossroads, that these crises aren't the end of the story. They're just plot twists that force us to change the narrative. Exactly. He thinks these challenges are wake-up calls. 
nudging us to evolve beyond the old systems and beliefs that got us into this mess. It's like the universe is giving us a cosmic timeout, saying, okay, humans, you've messed up, time to rethink your priorities. And he believes we have the tools to do just that. He points to all the amazing advancements in renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, and sustainable tech. It's like we're building the spaceship to escape this sinking ship, but we haven't quite figured out how to fly it yet. That's a great analogy. And Braden says the flight manual is within us. He encourages us to tap into our intuition, our connection to nature, that ancient wisdom that's in our DNA. So it's not just about external solutions, it's about inner transformation as well. Absolutely. He says outer change has to be mirrored by inner change. We need to cultivate qualities like compassion, forgiveness, and gratitude. It's like Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. But it's not just about individual change, right? We need to work together to change the systems too. Right. He emphasizes our interconnectedness, how our actions ripple out and affect everyone and everything. He says we need to come together as a global community to tackle these challenges. So it's like that scene in Avengers, Endgame where all the superheroes team up to fight Thanos. We need to combine our unique strengths to take on these global threats. Exactly. Brayden believes we all have a part to play in this grand evolutionary adventure. We all have something to offer. So we're all superheroes in a way. That's pretty empowering. It is. And the more we step into our power, the more we contribute our gifts to the world, the faster we'll be able to create a better future. Okay, I'm feeling inspired. But let's be real, it can feel a bit overwhelming sometimes, you know? <laughs> With all the bad news and the scale of the problems we're facing. I get it. Braden acknowledges that this journey isn't always easy. But he reminds us that we're not alone. We're part of something much bigger than ourselves. And we have access to a wisdom that's been guiding humanity for millennia. Like Glinda the Good Witch said, You've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. Exactly. And the more we trust in ourselves, in each other, and in the inherent goodness of the universe, the more smoothly we'll be able to navigate these challenges and create a world that truly reflects our highest potential. Well said. This has been an amazing conversation. We've explored some duck stuff today, but the conversation doesn't end here. Keep exploring, keep questioning, keep dreaming. And who knows, maybe we'll all unlock our superpowers along the way. Thanks for joining us.